All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're really delighted uh, to have you joining us today uh, for our uh, Wednesday lecture series on building a civil society. My name is Quinn Meekham. I am the Associate Director for Research and Academic Programs uh, at the Kennedy Center for International Studies here at BYU. And uh, we are really, really delighted uh, to be able to welcome Mina Chikara uh, to speak to us today. Uh, before uh, I introduce Professor Chikara, we just have a couple of announcements uh, looking forward. Uh, some events that many of you may be interested in today at uh, 4 p.m. in uh, 2.38 in the Kennedy Center, uh, there is a Cafe Europa uh, discussion, uh, a year of war in Ukraine, and that is today at 4 p.m. in 2.38 HRCB. Uh, tomorrow, the Global Women's Studies uh, Colloquium uh, meets, uh, so that's Thursday, March 2nd at 12 p.m., also in 238 HRCB, and the topic of the talk uh, tomorrow is Women Converts in Early Mormonism in the Americas, England, Ireland, and Scotland, uh, and the speaker is Marie uh, Cornwall, the founding coordinator of BYU uh, Women's Studies. Uh, next week, at this time, uh, we will be delighted to hear from David Fedman, who is a professor of history at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he has recently uh, helped produce a documentary feature on the firebombing of Tokyo during uh, World War II. He will be speaking on the topic of Tokyo from the Ashes, Burial and Funerary Rites in the Ruins of the War-Torn Metropolis. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the firebombing of Tokyo, uh, it is the largest single uh, most destructive uh, bombing raid in history. Uh, more than 100,000 people were killed. And uh, he will be speaking next week on the anniversary of that firebombing. Uh, also, his documentary, Paper City, will screen at International Cinema next Wednesday at 5, as well as having several other screenings uh, throughout the week. So we invite you uh, to consider attending uh, any of those events that are of interest to you. Uh, we would like to begin uh, our lecture today with an opening prayer. Natalie Bria, who is a student at BYU majoring in international relations, will offer that. So Natalie, over to you. Our Father in Heaven, we're so very grateful to be gathered here today to um, learn by Thy Spirit and and by the people that are educated that can teach us about how to contribute to a, a civil society. Father, we're so very grateful for the preparation that has been put into this presentation, and we pray that our hearts may be open to um, ways that we can change in the messages um, that will be given to us. Um, Father, we we love thee, and please help us that we can treat everyone as children of God, and um, we're grateful for the spirit and um, the opportunity to obtain an education. We love thee, and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, thank you, Natalie. <clears throat> uh, we have... Participants today meeting in 238 HRCB, um, where Natalie is, as well as participants meeting on Zoom. Um, for those of you in 238 HRCB, please note that we can't hear, hear you on Zoom, but we appreciate your participation there. All right, um, I am really delighted uh, to be able to introduce Mina Chikara, who is coming to us today from Harvard University. She is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology um, she received her PhD in psychology and social policy from Princeton um, and completed at the National Institutes of Health Ruth L. Kirstein National Research Service Award postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT as well. 
Uh, Professor Chikara is very well published and extremely well cited. Uh, she studies how the mind, brain, and behavior change when the social context of a particular interaction shifts from me and you uh, to us and them. Uh, Professor Chikara, uh, by family origin, comes from the former Yugoslavia. Um, and her parents come from different ethnicities. For those of you that, that know um, about the political history of the former Yugoslavia, it's very much an environment in which uh, different identity groups, whether they be majorities or minorities, right, have interacted in sometimes cooperative and sometimes deeply problematic and violent ways. Um, her talk today will focus on um, the risk of hate crimes um, and thinking about uh, how majority and minority status affects the propensity for hate crimes in a wide variety of situations. And we're very grateful today to be able to hear uh, about that as well from a psychological perspective, in addition to more of a political institutional perspective. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Chikara to BYU. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that. Lovely introduction. I just want to make sure you can hear me, yes? Good. Fabulous. Uh, thank you all so much for inviting me, for joining me today. It's a privilege to be able to share this work with you. I apologize for not being there with you in person, but it turns out having two small kids makes it pretty difficult to travel anywhere for anything these days. So I appreciate your patience for me uh, beaming in by Zoom from Cambridge. So with that, uh, you know a little bit about me already. I guess I would just share that more generally, my research is about how coalitions shape people's thoughts, their emotions, their brains, and their behavior. And so, for example, I study how processes such as empathy or understanding break down when the social context shifts from me and you to us and them. And I'm equally interested in how these beha the behavioral consequences of these processes unfolding and breaking down, including discrimination, conflict, and harm. But one thing with which I have been obsessed for several years now is this notion of context dependence and specifically how it informs our social inferences. So I'm gonna start with what I think is a fairly uncontroversial claim, which is that social groups are woven very tightly into the fabric of our lives, shaping how we perceive, how we punish, uh, who, how we, who we cooperate with and how we learn from other individuals. The challenge from my perspective is that I think that the dominant model of studying and seeking to understand intergroup dynamics has things potentially turned the wrong way around. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna start here uh, with a big picture and give you just a little bit of background from a sort of social psychological perspective, which is my subfield. So. There's a really prominent theory in social psychology called social identity theory, which says that people derive a sense of belonging, meaning, and self-esteem from the categories with which they identify. And this has been demonstrated not only for real social categories, but even for these sort of temporary or arbitrary sets of categories to which people are just assigned. So maybe some of you are familiar with this notion or demonstration of the minimal groups paradigm. And this is this idea that you can bring a bunch of people into a room, you can randomly assign them to team A and to team B, and by virtue of just having assigned them to those teams, people will start to prefer their own teammates and even allocate resources discriminately where they give more to people who belong to the same category that they do relative to those who do not. Now, the thing about this is that as a result of this demonstration and this theorizing, the contemporary intergroup literature has really emphasized the role of explicit category membership in predicting intergroup attitudes and behavior. But I'd like to argue that this approach is limited because social categories are not fixed homogeneous entities, right? For one, the associations with specific categories can change over time. So you can think of one example of this being when Italian and Irish immigrants became racialized as white in America in the early 20th century by assimilating into native white communities, despite having been marked as ethnic others prior to that time. Of course, allegiances between categories can also change. So you can think of America and Germany's relationship now relative to say 80 years ago, right? And of course that naturally changes the nature of attitudes and behavior that people then experience in those intergroup contexts. And third, what I'd argue is that not all categories carry with them 
sort of psychological potency of purposive groups. So for example, I don't think we've ever been really concerned about an uprising of brunettes, despite that being a visually identifiable category to which some people belong and others don't. The other thing that I'd argue is that studies based on social categories make it difficult to infer from them anything about generalized group processes. For example, some, but not all social categories are intrinsically confounded in differences in visual appearance of targets or visual means of marking targets as members of a particular group. Many groups carry with them particular stereotypes and associated prejudices, whereas others don't. Perceivers' familiarity with different categories will vary and so on and so on. And for example, I don't know which aspects of, say, an interracial interaction are necessarily going to port over into an interpolitical party interaction. And even if I did, would those generalize to a different space or to a different time? Now, finally, I'm going to argue that the category-based approach is limited because it's context insensitive. So it breaks down as agents' goals shift or as agents' other intersecting identities become salient. So you can consider as examples of this the adage, not all skin folk is kin folk, or widespread confusion as to how so many Hispanic and Latinx voters supported Trump in the 2020 election. Research treating demographic categories as purposive groups is going to run into these explanatory limitations over and over and may ironically end up reinforcing stereotypes and the belief that these categories are social monoliths. So studying only explicit categories, I'd argue, is unlikely to get us very far in the pursuit of understanding the general concept of groups. So the puzzle that sees me is what are the alternative cues? than to social group structure and organization that are potentially less subject to some of these limitations? And how can we use the cues that flexibly update our understanding of who is us and them and try to make predictions about the kinds of implications those coalitions or reformations may have for how people treat one another? So today I'm just going to be discussing one such cue to predict among the most consequential discriminatory behaviors there is hate crimes. So the first thing I need to convince you of all, it, or all of you, is that these ideas of coalitional formation and reformation can be scaled up to groups from individuals and used to make novel predictions about conflict. So let's take a step back here. Most of you, maybe all of you, are familiar with this visual illusion. It's called the Ebbinghaus illusion. When you look at the orange dots, you can't help but see the one on the right as being larger. However, when I remove the blue dots around them or the context around them, it's very clear now that the two orange dots are exactly the same size. This is a bit of a hacky analogy, but it, illust it illustrates a fundamental tenet of our psychology, which is that context really matters in shaping our perceptions and beliefs. And this is true for judgments of all kinds, ranging from psychophysics and visual illusions all the way up through social cognition. So what does this kind of reference dependence mean in a time of great demographic change compared to at any other point in history, right? And can we build a more generalized model of how alliances will shift invariant to the specific groups in question? So this is a project that's done in collaboration with Vicky Fuca, who is at Stanford, and Marco Tabellini, a colleague here, who's at the Harvard Business School, who are both economists by training. So the background for this particular project is as follows. The confluence of global political and economic upheaval coupled with humanitarian and climate crises as immigrants, refugees, and resident minoritized groups on the move in absolutely unprecedented numbers, right? The bulk of research, however, on these changes tends to focus exclusively on how this mobility impacts host countries' majority group members, either feelings about particular individual newcomer groups in, in one at a time, respectively, or potentially their sort of racial attitudes and policy preferences more generally. And so in this latter case, what I'm thinking of is examples of studies where we've found that white Americans tend to say that they are becoming more conservative or have um, more biased attitudes towards minoritized groups with the understanding that the census indicates that America is on its, well on its way to becoming a majority minority country, right? Now, one prevailing framework argues that there are specific Cat, there are specific characteristics of these minoritized migrant, refugee, and resident minoritized groups, right? And that those specific characteristics guide majority groups' attitudes towards them. And so lots of examples exist, right? So presumed skill of the groups in question, the perceived foreignness of the groups, the competitiveness and status of the groups in question, and so on and so forth. 
But there's a complementary alternative here, which is that majority groups are sensitive to a more generalized group feature that signals threat invariant to the group in question. So it doesn't matter who the specific group is, so long as this cue is activated, that is then going to engender a threat response from the majority group. Now, please note that in this talk, I am going to still rely on the notion of categories to define groups, but I hope to convince you that this work is pushing us towards a more feature-centric rather than a category-centric way of thinking about conflict. So what are one of these cues? One such generalized threat feature, which has garnered a lot of attention, particularly with increasingly shifting demographics in the US and Europe is group size. And the basic finding from 80 years of, of sociological work, of political science work, is that the larger groups become, the less well they are liked. But this relationship is not so straightforward. So one important but underappreciated complication comes back to that visual illusion. It's that size judgments of all kinds, of individual objects, of collectives, they're reference dependent. That means that the one's estimate of the size of a thing is always going to be determined relative to other accessible targets, whether that's in a choice set available to them in, in their immediate environment, or if it's sample, sampled from memory, or so on and so forth. So then it's not necessarily the case that new group arrival or new group growth is going to trigger threat amongst majority groups, right? It may be that new groups or groups that are demonstrating demographic change will have to sur surpass some threshold to be registered as a threat. But then, of course, the question becomes, well, what's that threshold, right? Now, related, because immigrants, refugees, and minoritized groups are not distributed evenly across a given geography, different communities may exhibit distinct hierarchies of prejudice across several minoritized groups. Critically, binary models of intergroup conflict, so just say black versus white or this religion versus that religion, they're not going to be able to account for these dynamics where there are multiple parties involved and there are potential coalitions that could form over these parties. But relying instead on the concept of reference dependence as a driver of intergroup attitudes and behavior can potentially help us get better traction on how group relational hierarchies change, both over time and across different communities. Okay, so what I want to introduce today is the group reference dependence hypothesis. And the idea here is pretty simple. It's just that majority group members' reactions to any one specific group in their community is going to depend on what other groups are also present in that community. And so in this paper, we tested a specific corollary of the general hypothesis, which is that rather than being sensitive to the absolute size of any one minoritized group, or even the size of that group relative to the majority group, communities are going to be sensitive to minoritized groups relative rank in size, being the most discriminating against whichever group represents the largest local minority, and then a little less discriminating against second rank, and even less discriminating against third, and all the way down. Now, why am I, where does this prediction come from? Well, people are demonstrably inaccurate in their judgments of the absolute size of things, whether it's you know, the number of jelly beans in a jar or the number of Asian people that live in their county, right? That said, they're actually pretty accurate in their judgments of collectives relative size with respect to one another. So I may not be able to tell you what proportion of people belong to category X versus Y in my neighborhood, but I can say with pretty good accuracy that X is bigger or smaller than Y. And I can build that ordinal relationship across multiple groups. So given humans' general sensitivity and accuracy with rank, we predict that majority groups will then, again, be most discriminating against that largest group, followed by the second largest minoritized group, and so on and so forth, above and beyond the actual size of the groups in question. And that's the critical thing here. And I'll get into this a little bit more when I talk to you about how we actually analyze this data. But the idea is that as demographics shift and groups increase in size-based rank, discriminatory behavior and attitudes towards them will shift accordingly. Okay, so how do we go about testing this? We test the reference group, uh, the group reference dependence hypothesis in the context first of the United States. So here what we did was we focused on majority group that is specifically here, white people's treatment of and attitudes toward four minoritized racial slash ethnic groups in the US. So we focused on black, Hispanic slash Latinx, Asian and Arab people. And what we do is we use data from the US census of the population between 1990 and 2010 to measure the size of each of these groups as a share of the total population. And from that size relative to one another, we compute their rank at the county level. 
Now, to examine discriminatory behavior against each of these minoritized groups, we use data on hate crimes, which are compiled, compiled by the FBI as part of the Uniform Crime Reporting Program. This data set is incredibly interesting, in part because first there's a sort of uniform criteria that gets applied to determining whether or not something's a hate crime across the entire US. And there is variability across sites, and we can get into that. There are problems with this data set. But to just start, one of the things that's incredibly important to note about this data set is that for each entry, there is a column that indicates the bias motivation of each crime. So an entry may say something like anti-Black or anti-Semitic or anti-Muslim and so on, as well as the race of the perpetrator that's also reported. So our first dependent variable is when hate crimes committed by white offenders against a given group in a given county in a given decade expressed as a fraction of that county's total population. So hate crimes towards a given group in a given county in a given decade per 100,000 inhabitants. And so we combine these two data sources, the census with the FBI data, to create this county by group by decade data set. And then we can study the relationship between how often hate crimes are committed against a particular group with respect to that group's rank in its county in terms of its size. Now, it's also important to note that hate crimes are fairly rare. And so we would wanna look at what we would consider an intervening variable that puts us somewhere between a threat response and committing a hate crime. So we also look at attitudinal data, which is drawn from a database called Project Implicit. So we look at thermometer ratings for each of these categories across that same time window. And we look both in the US as well as the UK to test whether or not these results generalize across different contexts with really different demographic distribution. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to see was just descriptively whether there was any relationship between rank and hate crimes above and beyond the size of a group. So what I'm showing you here is a panel looking only at Hispanic victims across different decades and counties. And so what we have along the horizontal axis is the group's share of the total population. So per 100,000 inhabitants, as you get up higher across the X axis, that means that the group represents a larger proportion of the population in that county in that decade. And then on the Y axis, the vertical axis, we have hate crimes per 100,000. Critically, what we've done is we've color coded that the Hispanic group in this county in this decade, depending on whether it's in first or second place in the rank distribution of all of the other groups that are in that county. So the question is, along, as you move along the X axis, where the red dots and the blue dots overlap is the first place, the blue dot higher relative to the second place. And the answer is yes, a Hispanic group present in equal relative numbers across two counties is more likely to get victimized when they represent the largest group in the county as compared to when they represent the second largest group in that county. So this is apparent for Hispanic groups of any relative size and for black people as their relative size increases and becomes increasingly clear for Asian people as their relative size increases. Now, here's another way to look at that first order relationship. This is the relationship between the incidence of hate crimes against a group and that group's rank in the county and decade for a very narrow range around the threshold when the group switches its rank. That is to say, when the group is just big enough to fall into first place or just a little bit less big to fall into second place. And then on the x-axis, what we have is that difference in the size of the group from the size of the group that it's, that's its nearest neighbor. So any groups that go to the right of the zero point represent the groups that are in first place and those that fall to the left of the group are those cases where they fall into second place. And I'm hoping what's jumping out at you is a pretty stark discontinuity pattern. So counties that are to the right of the zero threshold where the group is in first place, it's the largest minority in that county, they register more hate crimes against the group compared to counties just to the left of that threshold. So if rank had no explanatory power whatsoever for victimization rates above and beyond just size, we should expect that the relationship between hate crimes per capita and the difference for the largest other group should be continuous around that zero threshold. It should go straight through on a continuous line. But there's another thing you maybe notice when you look at this. We don't see discontinuity levels directly at the zero threshold. So it's not like the line jumped at the zero threshold. This suggests that it's not actual, but rather perceived rank that matters for group victimization. Why? Because tiny differences in size that place a group just in first place or just in second place aren't big enough to get noticed by the majority group and therefore don't 
seem to matter very much for predicting hate crimes. But as that size difference becomes large enough to be detectable, now we see that majority behavior adjusts accordingly. So the main takeaway from this first set of data is just that both group size and rank seem to matter and maybe separable pathways by which threat is registered by the majority group. But of course, all of you must be thinking, well, maybe these first order relationships are spurious. Maybe there is some third variable that can account for all of these things, right? For, for example, Hispanic and Latinx people are the largest minority in most Southwestern states and counties. Persistent negative views towards those groups just so happen to be correlated with that group because it, they also represent, they're also the closest to the Southern border with Mexico, right? So in order to deal with this, we ran a fixed effect model specification, which is just a fancy way of saying a regression where we control for a lot of really important things. So the first thing is that we, uh, we account for any county specific factor. So that's observable or unobservable about any particular county that can affect the frequency of hate crimes towards any one of the groups in the data set, right? This includes things like a county's geographical location, but also things like any county's persistent levels of outgroup intolerance across the decades that we're looking. We also account for time invariant factors specific to each minoritized group in our data set across all counties across the whole time that we're looking. So this is things like accounting for the fact that we across all counties and across all decades will observe higher average levels of prejudice against Hispanic, Latinx, and Black people relative to say Asians and Arabs in the in the county, in any county as a whole. And then finally, we net out decade specific shocks that are common across all counties and across all groups. Um, and so this would be something like, you know, oh, the 2008 economic downturn affected the entire country. So maybe there's more scapegoating of minoritized populations that's going on across everywhere. And so this fixed effect would account for that. Now, critically, we always control for a nonlinear function of the size of each minoritized group. Thereby, we isolate the effect of rank from a more general size effect, which as I noted, had been previously documented in many different papers. So controlling for the size of a group ensures that the effect we identify is not driven by just differential base rates of encountering category members across different groups and counties. So even if attacks towards a particular group occurred at random, the probability of a hate crime perpetrators randomly encountering a member of a particular racial or ethnic group would already be captured by the group's share of the total population. So what we're always looking for is the effect of rank above and beyond that. Okay. So in our, the results that I'm about to show you, we always use the smallest group in the given county and decade as the reference category. And then I'm going to show you how much more likely the first, second, and third groups are to be victimized relative to that fourth group. Okay. So here, what I'm showing you is the marginal effect of rank. So the likelihood of being targeted by uh, hate crime per 100,000 inhabitants as a function of whether that group in that county in that decade is in first, second, or third relative to fourth place. So what you see here is that conditional on a minoritized group size, its rank is still predictive of its victimization rate. And just to give you a sense of what this effect size is, a group experiences approximately one more hate crime per 100,000 county residents when it moves from fourth to first place in the size rank distribution of that county. And this effect, though one hate crime doesn't sound like much, it actually corresponds to 107% of the average county level victimization rate of a group across the three decades that we looked. Now the second and the third largest minorities are, uh, minoritized groups are at greater danger than the fourth group, but the second and the first, the first is still worse off than the second and the third and the second and the third aren't different from one another. Now, you may be wondering, well, what could account for these effects? There are still a bunch of other things that could potentially be accounting for these findings. Well, the, we look at dozens of robustness checks, and I'm not going to belabor all of them here, but I do want to hit some highlights. So it doesn't seem to be the case that it's merely capturing rising prejudice against groups that are growing over time, because we observe our effects of rank even when we have a group by decade fixed effect. Neither does rank capture changing characteristics of county over time, so it persists even when we have a county by decade fixed effect in their interaction. The findings are not an artifact of the nonlinear effects of relative group size, so it turns out non-parametrically controlling for size actually just makes our effects on rank stronger. It doesn't matter whether we 
look at group size as a share of the total population or even just as a share of the minoritized population, rank still has an effect. And if you think about it for a second, that share of the minoritized population specification is super stringent because share of the minoritized population is just a continuous transformation of the rank variable that's also in the regression with it that's still predicting hate crimes above and beyond it, right? Which speaks to the role that the perceivability and the encodability of rank-based information can play in guiding majority group members' behaviors. Turns out it doesn't matter if we control for the relative, the sizes of all other groups or even its nearest neighbor or competitor, if you will. Uh, and finally, it's also not captured by faster growing minoritized groups in some counties. So our effects remain robust to controlling for county specific growth rate of minority group generation in the data set. Other things you might be thinking about, uh, rank isn't capturing the effect of a group size in neighboring counties or in the broader, broader geographic region. So if we control for a state by decade, by group by decade fixed effect, we still see effects of rank at the county level. If we try to look at the data at the state level, the effect goes away. So it's not present in uh, at units of analysis that are not really perceivable by a lived experience. It does not seem to be driven by rural or low population density counties. In fact, our results get stronger when we weight the regressions by uh, county population to increase the influence of urbanized locations that have denser populations. And finally, we don't find any indication that the effective rank is driven by a reporting bias in the Uniform Crime Reporting Report. So one concern you may have is, oh, well, some groups are going to be targeted with violent hate crimes, other groups will be targeted with nonviolent hate crimes, things like property destruction or defacing of property. Um, when we restrict our analyses only to violent hate crimes, we, 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 get, we recoup our results, we, we replicate everything. So even if you restrict just that kind of hate crimes, we still see the effects of rank across the different counties and groups in the decades that we look. Things you might also be wondering is, uh, well, does this vary by what region of the US you're in? It turns out it's pretty it's pretty consistent across the different geographic subscales. So our results are uh, common or, or they're the same across the four sort of U.S. census-defined macro regions. Though the effect is weaker in the Northeast, we suspect that this is mostly due to the fact that there are just fewer counties in the new, uh, Northeast, and so therefore we're underpowered there. Um, examining a smaller unit of regional analysis, the effective rank doesn't seem to depend on the distribution of minoritized groups within the county. So we see that uh, the largest minority in a county is equally likely to be victimized in counties with high and low racial and ethnic diversity, uh, though it does slightly depend on which measure of diversity we use. Those counties that are more diverse see a bigger difference between that reference group, the fourth rank group, and second and third. So second and third are worse off in more diverse populations. But if you think about that for a second, it makes sense because higher diversity implies higher representation and visibility of these smaller second and third rank groups compared to a situation where there's just one dominant minoritized group. So um, the other thing that's really important to note is that uh, segregation matters. So we don't see our effects in those counties where segregation is low, as defined by median split on a segregation index, but it is very robust and our effect generally seems to be driven much more by those places that are more segregated. One thing you might be thinking about, well, is there something about the groups themselves that changes as they increase in their rank that might be inviting these kinds of hate crimes? So it's not the threat of just the size, but there's something that happens as groups get bigger that changes how they behave that could then be driving majority groups members' responses to them. Maybe they're accruing greater material power, or maybe they're accruing greater political power, right? So we don't find any effective rank on groups' labor market outcomes, so employment rate and labor force participation. It does not seem to be the case that being the highest ranked group is necessarily good for your household income. Um, not only are the results not significant, they are also ambiguous in direction and kind of change direction, depending on which rank you're talking about. But overall, there's no evidence that economic outcomes respond to rank or work as a channel by which uh, rank has its effects on hate crimes. And we also looked at uh, congressional house race participation as well as outcomes as a way of trying to index political power. And what we see is that there's no evidence that rank affects the probability of running for Congress or of being elected. 
So it's not the case that as your group gets bigger at a county, you're more likely to run or you're more likely to win. Um, if anything, you're actually less likely to run. That's our, our biggest finding. Uh, the group's share of candidates that you see a suppression there on that third icon, the square for the first rank group, which suggests that it's actually suppressed political power is happening to the largest group rather than them gaining more political power. Um, they're not even getting into the arena, let alone winning. Now, we also provide evidence against county group specific changes in minoritized groups behavior that could be correlated with or even be characterized as something that would provoke more aggression from majority group perpetrators. So the FBI database provides no indication that racial ethnic group members can commit more hate crimes, either in general or against whites, um, as their rank in their county changes. So the blue data that I'm showing here is, again, just the same data that I showed you a few slides ago. This is likelihood of being receiving a hate crime. But these gray dots are the likelihood of uh, committing a violent crime, committing uh, nonviolent crime, or committing a crime specifically against whites. And we don't see that there's any effect of rank on that kind of behavior. Now, a remaining potential concern would be that even estimates from our fixed effects analyses could be influenced by some latent third variable that we haven't captured here. So to address these and similar possibilities, we exploit the fact that groups experience changes in their rank within the same county over the three decades that we look. So for example, between 1990 and 2010, Hispanic Latinx groups rose in rank on average, whereas other minoritized groups' relative ranks fell. That said, this average pattern data that I'm showing you here masks pretty wide variation, both in terms of the direction of rank switches, as well as their spatial distribution across the US. So what we did here was we tried to reanalyze the data by exploiting variation in rank switches across groups. So here we estimate the effect of rank by only comparing victimization rates within group county cells across decades. And so intuitively, what this strategy does is it compares the change in victimization suffered by two minoritized groups whose relative size increases by the same amount, but who in one case experiences a rank change because of what's going on with all the other groups, and in the other case, keeps the same rank across the different decades. And so what I'm going to show you in the red dots is the baseline specification you've already seen, and then the blue dots are going to be the data from the rank switch analyses. And what you see here is that the blue dots show that even in the rank switch analysis, rank continues to predict the frequency of group specific hate crimes. So holding the change in relative size constant across two decades, moving from last to first rank, predicts that a minoritized group will experience an increase in the frequency of hate crimes that is equal to approximately 64% of the average victimization rate of all groups across all decades. One thing that's incredibly interesting to me is that the rank effects are roughly symmetric. So the increase in victimization that a group experiences when it moves from second to first place is roughly equivalent in magnitude to the decrease it experiences when moving from first to second. So this suggests a sort of substitution is happening in prejudice across groups. And it's consistent with majority group members sort of distributing a fixed amount of prejudice <laughs> across these different minoritized targets. And maybe saying it another way, what this looks like is a reformation of coalitions across these different categories where yes, people are more violent against a new foe, but they're simultaneously more tolerant against an old one. Now, like I said earlier, when I was setting up the methods, uh, hate crimes are a fairly extreme manifestation of prejudice against minoritized groups. So one widely studied intermediate link between group size and rank, uh, group size rank and a behavioral outcome like hate crimes is gonna be attitudes. So in this data set, we only have attitudes towards Black, Asian, and Arab people because the data that we use, the Project Implicit data, which is a web-hosted test where you get people to do these implicit association tasks, but you also get explicit thermometer ratings of these different groups. They just don't have one that includes Hispanic people as a target. So we're going to look at the effects on these three remaining groups, both in the U.S. and the U.K., on how warm warmly or coldly people say they feel towards each of these different groups as a function of that group's rank in its county and its decade. So what you're going to see here in red is baseline specification. Blue is going to be rank switch analyses again. And now you're going to be looking for lower numbers, meaning more prejudice. That means cooler ratings relative to that third rank group. 
And so that's what we see across both kinds of specifications, both in the US and in the UK. Now, one of the things that I think is really important here to just take a step back and appreciate is that our data look extremely similar for a completely different outcome measure. And it seems to generalize across two different contexts, with really different demographic makeups. One of the other things that's really amazing about the UK data is the very high level of granularity that it affords. So I have here uh, these little, the circle is LSOA, MSOA, LAD. These are just different units of regional analysis that are given in the UK data. So LSOAs are really, really small. They're, the median size of one is 7,000 people. MSOAs are about 15,000 people. No, sorry, LSOAs are 1,500 people. MSOAs are 7,000 people. And these local authority districts, these are now anywhere between 10K and 1.5 million. The LADs really look like counties look in the US context. And what's really interesting here is that when moving the analysis to the low, we recover effects that are similar to those we estimated for U.S. counties, but they're actually stronger in magnitude and in terms of precision when you look at these smaller units of analysis, which strongly suggests to us that it's really what people perceive, what their lived experiences are, that is accounting for the effective rank on attitudes that are reported in this data set. So to wrap up, uh, I want to make sure we leave lots of time for questions. What we observe is that increased rank is associated with higher likelihood of being targeted with hate crime and more negative attitudes. Uh, we, we find that it does seem to be both based on the discontinuity analyses and these regional units of analysis perceived not actual rank that's driving these and that it, it most likely reflects local experience, local lived experience, so who you see when you go to the market or the post office and so on. Now, one thing you may be thinking is why are groups or why are individuals sensitive to group size rank when they're so inaccurate in these other numeracy judgments of them like absolute size or even proportions, right? Well, it turns out these rank transformations of distributional information represent a form of efficient coding that's present across a very wide variety of domains when you basically get people to ask, ask people to generate numerical representations of just about anything. It turns out human estimates of proportions, they reflect representations that seem to have been transformed into log odds. And what that does is it means that people generally tend to overestimate small proportions and underestimate large proportions. So there's a distortion in the distribution that kind of flattens a little bit. But what these distortions don't affect is the ordinal variable or the ordinal ranking of those representations. So that's how rank potentially still has an important role to play here. And so how does this rank ordering then translate into discrimination? Well, we speculate that people begin from the premise that they have finite resources with which to defend their groups. This then generates a rank ordering of threat from greatest urgency to least urgency. And in principle, why people could maintain staunchly negative attitudes towards everybody in their community who's not them, they would in practice end up entirely surrounded by foes. So one strategy then is to infer new groupings. That is again, to become relatively more inclusive towards those less threatening groups over time. And our rank asymmetry effects actually uh, dovetail really nicely with that, that idea. So this comports with dynamics that we're seeing play out in real time. And so this is a report from Southern Poverty Law Center uh, last summer indicating that nearly seven in 10 Republicans surveyed agreed that at least some extent that demographic changes in the US were deliberately driven by progressive politicians attempting to gain political power by replacing more conservative white voters um, and that there was substantial support for threatening or acting violently against perceived political opponents. So this idea of demographic distributions is very active in the political sphere and is indeed having an effect on people's emotional reactions to those demographic distributions. Our framework also makes novel predictions about how demographic shifts may affect coalitional structures in the year to come. So for instance, Asian Americans continue to be the country's fastest growing racial category with immigration being a major driver of this growth. So it's possible that as Hispanic and Asian populations continue to grow and particularly those places where they start to outnumber other groups, uh, they're more likely to get targeted. Another thing that might matter is it could change which features matter for prejudice, moving the access from say skin tone to language or accent, which language you speak, heard sp spoken most in your community. And then a broader theoretical point is that the, the current findings sort of dispel the notion that attitudes and behaviors towards social categories are fixed or somehow derived from categories essentialized properties, that there's something in them that elicits or provokes these kinds of reactions. 
And so the reason I think this is important is that people, the more that people understand when and why prejudice and discrimination are flexibly deployed, the more empowered they may feel to combat it. So with that, I just want to thank my funding sources and, of course, all of you. And I'm eager to take any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mina. We really appreciate that. Um, uh, a virtual round of applause um, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, this, uh, uh, this talk's generated a lot of thoughts. Uh, I've been collecting some questions from folks who are on Zoom, and uh, those who are uh, watching uh, in the lecture hall may also have some questions. And so uh, what I'm going to do is, is just try to group together some questions that have come through, uh, and we'll, res uh, we'll go until 1 p.m., but uh, we will reserve um, the last five minutes for any questions coming from students who are watching in, in 238. And so if you have those, um, just let uh, Stan Benfel, who's uh, there and joining us, uh, know you have questions and we'll have you ask those uh, from the room. Uh, so uh, this was very uh, good on evidence. You have lots of evidence and lots of different checks to see if what you think you're observing, you likely are observing. And so I thought it was quite compelling in terms of being able to persuade that rank matters. Uh, some bigger questions uh, that uh, perhaps you could address are uh, some of the broader implications. So you mentioned in your conclusion that perhaps demographic change in the United States, for example, might lead to a different number of hate crimes being uh, you know, uh, occurring against groups that might be growing in the future, rising to first rank. But I'm wondering if you have any other additional implications, particularly about what can be done, if anything. And uh, I think a, a similar question is, is why uh, is this happening? We, we understand from your talk that uh, um, there are some psychological factors at work in terms of perception. Um, but why is this happening at base? And then um, what does that imply about what can be done about it? Yeah, great. Those are excellent questions. Thank you so much. So with respect to implications, um, I think the implications that I'm most concerned about is that uh, we are potentially likely to downplay the likelihood or underestimate the likelihood that a particular group is going to get victimized because we tend to look at the data at a much higher level of aggregation, whether it's the state level or the federal level. But what that includes, of course, is that there are many communities that are at high risk, even those that have in the sort of stereotype discourse been characterized as model minorities who are potentially a much greater risk in their local communities. And because we tend not to pay close attention to those local community uh, data, we tend to miss how much risk there might be present for those local communities and for them to be aware of it and also for perpetrators, potential perpetrators to be aware of it and why it might be happening. I think that's a really important thing to do. One of the things that came up for us while we were doing this, while we were trying to put together these data analyses was that there's so many other groups that have been targeted by hate crimes, for example, that are in that bias motivation category for which we don't have census data. So we can't even begin to ask the question, for example, of around anti-Semitism, because there is no data in the census on religious affiliation um, across the different counties in the US. So if we could also start to collect more data there, then we would be able to observe whether or not these patterns are upheld when you're looking at other cross-sectional identities that are incredibly important for people's day-to-day -day lives, their coordination, but also their likelihood of being targeted with violent crime as well as negative attitudes. And so it speaks to the kind of data that we should potentially consider collecting as a country um, in order to better understand those relationships. The thing that I think that is the most interesting is that, you know, for example, race and ethnicity is an incredibly important dimension that organizes our lives politically, socially, economically, materially, so on and so forth. But it may be that our specific notions of what counts as race, i.e. skin tone, will shift depending on which groups we're thinking about and which groups are more, most likely to get targeted. So that was the point that I was trying to make on that second to last slide. 
it could be the case that where you know you see Hispanic families or um, East Asian or Southeast Asian or South Asian families begin to outnumber other local minoritized groups that, you know, it's not skin tone that matters so much anymore, but it's language or accent that really seems to matter. And the thing that I think, uh, and, and the reason I think that this is a legitimate concern is again, those demographic changes. It, it was for several decades the case that our fastest growing group was Hispanic Latinx. It's no longer the case. So for example, I think we have, I think that Data indicate that there are actually negative flows of um, Mexican immigrants in the US in the last few, maybe in the last decade, so that there are more people leaving actually than there are coming in. Now that's just Mexico, there are other countries obviously, um, also in Central and South America, so on and so forth that have different kinds of uh, demographic flows. But suffice to say that um, who's fastest growing now is changing. And that's really, really important to pay close attention to because it's going to start to, you know, I think, for example, Asian Americans' tenuous status as model minority may, model minorities may actually begin to wane and they will see begin to climb. And I think that, you know, we've certainly seen some evidence of just how tenuous that status is with hate crimes that are related to COVID in the last few years, right? We've seen some really heinous instances of hate crimes targeting the Asian American community. And that was not on people's radars necessarily, uh, you know, for, for several years prior to that. So those are some of the implications that I think are really important in a practical sense. Um, other things that I would love to think more about is what cues are people using to encode the actual numbers or ranks of people? You know, it could be that they're trying to pay attention to who's around them, but it could be that there are other markers, other cultural markers, like whether or not there are specialized supermarkets that start to open, or there are restaurants, or there are religious institutions that mark the presence of a particular group in a community that suggests that this group is getting big enough that we need to build services to provide them with food or a place to worship or what have you, right? And that those markers are going to be the things that sort of drive people's attention to the size of those groups. That also has really interesting implications for how much you sort of how, how um, segregated you, you make those institutions, right? If you start to show that there's an enclave building that may be much more readily perceived as a threat as though, you know, relative to if it's like geographically distributed. Um, so lots of really interesting open questions and, and implications I think to think about going forward. Um, thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm, uh, we have a bunch of questions about things that might matter. And uh, I'm just going to throw some of these out, and you can respond to any of them that, that might uh, be relevant to you. So you highlighted that research has suggested that the size of the group matters. Um, one question is, how much does the size of the group matter compared to rank? Um, uh, what about very small sizes mm -hmm. of groups, right, that are just not perceived as a demographic threat that maybe represent 2% of the population or something, but they still have a ranking. Uh, at one point, you uh, showed us a slide that said that uh, the, the effects for Hispanic and Asian groups tended to be stronger than for the black community. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you have a theory about that. And then uh, a question from Elise around intersectionality. Mm -hmm. If you have <clears throat> somebody who is in a, uh, who intersects with a number of, of potentially uh, potential identity groups that are uh, might lead to discrimination, but it mm -hmm. makes them a particularly small group mm -hmm. because of that intersectionality. Uh, does that lead to more risk or less risk? Mm -hmm. the, the size is going down, but the potential areas for discrimination um, go up. And then finally, uh, how much do you see this applying, not just to hate crimes, but to any forms of, of racism and discrimination? Yeah. You do yeah, have the thermometer results that, that you discussed briefly, but uh, we're just wondering if there are differential effects depending on the behavior you expect. Yeah, yeah, that's, those are great questions. Okay, so starting for the relative effects of size versus rank. So size matters. Uh, when you look at the regressions, including both size and ranks, I focused on the effects of rank, 
but, and I didn't want to overwhelm people with these like massive regression tables with, you know, 15 predictor variables and fixed effects and what have you. But the bottom line is size is always also significant, a significant positive predictor of hate crimes as well as negative attitude. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, for our purposes in this paper, we were really engaged in the theory testing exercise, which was that rank feels like this thing that is cognitively accessible and, and easily encoded, and therefore it may play this outsized role in predicting who gets targeted. But that said, um, if we were looking to maximize the variance explained in the data, actually what we would have been including was also an interaction between rank and size. So if you remember those discontinuity plots, when you're in the second ranked position to the zero point, the line is pretty flat. So size doesn't seem to matter for the second rank group, but you do see that uptick for the first rank group. So it's not just rank and it's not just size. It may also be size as a function of rank where size matters more for that biggest group, but less and less so for the second, third and fourth rank groups. Uh, so that was that one. And then in terms of who gets most targeted, so those, those Scatter plots are a little bit misleading. We actually did do our analyses within each ethnicity, just looking at when that ethnicity is in first, second, and third place. And actually our effects are strongest for Black and Latinx targets. They're weakest for Asian targets. And there are a couple of reasons why that might be the case. One of the reasons is that there are far fewer counties where they end up in the first, first ranked uh, position relative to, they're, they're much more often second and third ranked. Other reasons include things that Asian is not a real thing. That's a thing that the U.S. made up. And so Asian includes people from many, many different countries, dozens of countries, right? And so it's this very diffuse category relative to the way that people conceptualize and represent Black Americans and Hispanic Latinx Americans. So uh, part of that may also come from the fact that there are particular nation, nationalities or ethnicities within the Asian category that are more or less likely to get targeted because that category collapses across many different groups and is therefore much more heterogeneous as compared is, as viewed from a white person's perspective. So those are a couple of reasons why we think that the Asian groups, I mean, to say nothing also of the, the model minority status, but the effects are still there. They're just not significant when you look at Asians alone and then just look at the effect of being first, second or third rank for within that group. Okay, that's two. What was the third one? <laughs> I forgot it. Um, intersectionality was one of the questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, right. So what? maybe right before that one, what do you do with really, really tiny groups? So one of the things that I think is incredibly important to remember, and, I, and I'm so grateful someone asked this question because I always mean to and forget to mention, I don't, I would never argue that rank is the only input in predicting negative attitudes and discrimination and hate crimes towards a group. Of course, there's all sorts of rhetoric that can make a particular, even incredibly small group seem outside, seem like an outsized threat, either symbolically or materially or what have you, right? So when you ask, um, I'm sure all of you have seen these data, when you ask people to estimate the number of trans people in the US, they think it's like 15%. If you ask them to estimate the percentage of the US population is a Jewish, they say 30%. I mean, these like huge numbers relative to what the actual demographic numbers of these groups are. And they also receive a disproportionate amount of hatred and violence. Um, compared to groups that are larger than them. So where does that come from, right? It's not their size. Uh, it comes in part from rhetoric, right? Whether it's political rhetoric, it's um, social rhetoric, it's religious rhetoric, there are different messages that people are receiving that are top down, that are also informing their perceptions of this threat in addition to the sort of bottom up demographic information. So I would never say that the demographic distribution is the only thing that's playing a role in predicting who's gonna get victimized here. It's a very incomplete story, but I think it's an important story, uh, an important finding worth sharing because it does have some of these other implications we talked about earlier. And then with respect to intersectionality, I mean, intersectionality, I mean, it's a fascinating question. It's going to depend on how, whether or not a person's intersectionality is actually legible in the sort of outside world, the way that it is in other contexts, right? So if you see somebody like of course, historically also, um, anecdotally, you know, and, and there's also work by the late great Jim Sedanius to indicate that, for example, black men are much more likely to be targeted with violence than black women are. Um, and that also shows up in the FBI hate crime data. That said, 
are black women not targeted with violence? Absolutely not. Are they targeted with other forms of discrimination and, and hatred? Absolutely they are. And, you know, there are lots of other variables that we haven't been able to look at here. Things like economic mobility or healthcare outcomes or educational outcomes, right? And these are data sets that are actually being made available to us so that we can look at how rank impacts these other forms of harm, but that they aren't explicitly violent forms um, in the same way that something like a hate crime is. And so those are those are places where you might expect actually the gender information to invert, right? So that maybe black women are more likely to be targeted um, with with neglect in the healthcare system than say black men or something like this. So I guess it, it, I guess what I would say is that it probably depends somewhat on the context and how what whether a person is read as primarily you know a person of this particular racial or ethnic category or if they their their intersecting identities actually do make them feel like a completely separate category member for the person who's perceiving them. Uh, thank you so much. We could talk about this for a long time. There's so much richness here, uh, but our time is up and I really appreciate those of you that asked uh, great questions and um, for participating with us and special thanks again to you, uh, Professor Chikara. Uh, we are grateful uh, for the research that you do uh, the way that you are able to communicate it and uh, and raise uh, some really provocative uh, questions for us today. Thank you so much.